So thanks for coming. We on here? Yep. So thank you everybody for showing up today and, and speaking with us. Um, we want to talk today um, for a couple of reasons. Um, Adopting Elixir is the name of a book that came out. Um, I got my paper copy today. Um, we have a copy to give away. It isn't in my hands yet, but um, the best questions will give away three books. One is a, um, a beginning book on functional programming with Elixir. One is seven languages in seven weeks, and one is adopting Elixir. We actually have the seven languages book here. The other ones, um, if you win them, you'll have to wait, um, and they will be the best questions for the panelists. And I don't know how we're gonna determine that yet. Um, but anyway, I'd like to, um, to have a chance for each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff McGee. Um, I work for Vary, which is a software consultancy here in town. Um, we focus on blockchain, uh, data science and machine learning, and uh, Internet of Things. Uh, so most of what I'm going to talk about with Elixir is going to be in the Internet of Things realm, um, and that's where I have some experience. I'm Anna Sherman. I'm a developer at Carbon5. We're a tech consultancy. Um, and I've had, are we getting into like our experience with Elixir? That's fine. Yeah, um, I guess I've been writing Elixir for, I guess, a year and a half or so, but nothing too crazy, mostly just the mundane things that you, you do uh, when you're testing out a new language. Uh, I'm Craig Lyons, I'm a developer, also at Carbon5. The majority of my Elixir experience is not at Carbon5. I've got a startup of my own that I'm working on. Uh, and I chose Elixir to, I just really wanted to learn it. It was a good fit uh, tech-wise, and it was also an opportunity to learn it while building a small business. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm not really sure why I'm here, but they had food here, so <laughs> you always know where a free sandwich is, am I right? Uh, no, I've been hanging out with, uh, I've been hanging out in the Elixir community since, I don't know, forever ago, several, several years ago now. I think I, I think I started actively sort of contributing when it was like 0 0.14 or something like that. So I've been around for a bunch of years um, and helped like start some of the Elixir stuff in town. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. I'm Neil Manet. I work for a company called Pylon. We do conversational platform stuff for like Alexa and Google Home and the like. Switched to Elixir not that long ago, but we kind of jumped all in on it. So, so this is the way it's going to work. Um, you know, I know that panels in general have a bad reputation. They shouldn't because we're really tapping the experience of people who know things that we want to know. Um, but what I'd like to do is ask the, ask uh, a couple of questions um, that one or more of the panel will answer. Um, to warm them up a bit for you, warm you guys up a little bit, and then you can we'll open questions to the audience. Um, and the questions can be to obviously anyone here um, or me. So the first question is, um, you know, this, this panel is on adopting Elixir um, and that has a connotation of a from and a to. My question is where, what language are you coming from and um, what did you do with it and what do you like about it? Does anyone want to take that one? I can do that. Um, so a lot of my professional experience is in Ruby on Rails. Uh, and sometimes those are apps that start small and then they grow and grow and grow. Uh, so you start working on ways to maintain that. Uh, but when I reached for Ruby on Rails in the past, I would, I would use it for prototyping, mostly when I want to slam up something pretty quickly and get it in front of people, see if it's going to work out. Uh, then for bigger projects, it tends to be Java. Um, it's, you know, everybody's written some Java, Java's king, right? So a lot of experience there, and uh, a few apps in Node.js where concurrency was really important. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into some differences. But that's, that's where I'm coming from. Anybody else want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, um, with regards to sort of the internet of things and hardware development, um, I'm coming from a little bit of embedded C, um, which can be a pain if you haven't spent years and years and years trying to learn it and become an expert. Um, and then also, uh, in general, speaking for our company, um, we're 
mostly have a bunch of web development experts and uh, really, so sort of the web stacks in terms of uh, you know Ruby on Rails mainly um, and then we're starting to move to Phoenix but it was, it was nice for us without getting too far ahead to the next question, it was nice for us to take a language like Elixir which is present both in the web and has a hardware presence. Um, so it allowed us to, you know, transfer nicely some of the skills that we know from web, so. So Anna, I know that you've done some mentoring um, and that you find Ruby is a particularly good language for mentoring in, and why is that true for you? Um, I find the, like, the high level in which you write Ruby, it's more colloquial, it's easier for people to understand who haven't done programming before, um, and so it kind of eases them into the syntax of things. Um, and there's been some, a good community around the structure of curriculum too that has been helpful and it being able to just like pick up some curriculum and, and help educate um, people. So the Rails Bridge has been, um, I've done a, a couple of those and those have been, I feel like, very successful and helpful. Um, but taking that kind of platform, um, jumping into Elixir, Elixir has that same kind of high colloquial way of, of writing. So we're starting to do some Elixir bridges to, to get people interested in, in Elixir. And um, Chris or Neil, um, where you came from and why you liked it? Uh, so I guess for me, before I came to Pylon, I got to make the ridiculous claim that I'd never used the same language twice at work. Uh, but the streak was broken and I went back to Python. But our, our service didn't work the way we needed it to. So we had to switch to something that did concurrency and real-time messaging was kind of the model that we were thinking in. Uh, Elixir slash Erlang kind of answered that question the most directly. Chris, you want to crack? Yeah, so for me, uh, it's very similar to, uh, to Craig's uh, background. I did a lot of like Rails stuff. I'd come from a big, like, big Java web app, uh, lots of objects everywhere. Um, and so I did a lot of that for a lot of, a lot of years. And uh, yeah, I was doing a lot of Node and Rails when I, when sort of Elixir landed. And uh, I was excited to kind of get involved in that. Uh, um, so one of my favorite cartoons is uh, um, a guy walking down the stairs and there's, um, actually is a rabbit walking down the stairs and there's um, a messed up fan on the top of the, at the top of the um, room, and then there are bunny parts all over, and um, and the rabbit is saying, "Stuff went wrong." <laughs> <laughs> so the question now is, what went wrong? What what made you start looking beyond, you know, the the heavenly bliss of where you were, of Ruby or Python or or Python or wherever you're from? For me. Um I was like a, I was sort of a dyed in the wool, like I was gonna make OO work for me. Like I was gonna like figure out how to make OO work for me, regardless of uh, if that was practical or reasonable or, or whatever. Like, and so I was like super into Ruby, super into best practices and those sorts of things. Um, and I, when Elixir came out, uh, I started looking at it and I suddenly realized like all the things I had been trying to force myself to do in Ruby um, you know, and trying to follow all these best practices, I just no longer needed to do because they were sort of enforced at a language level. I was like, oh, I, I don't have to like fight to decouple things and decouple state because I have processes and I have all these other ways of managing this stuff. Uh, I have all this inversion of control built into the language. Like I don't even have to think about that. Um, and it was just like a total, and then and on top of that, I had this giant fault tolerant platform to build things on. Uh, you know, to build, to build whatever I needed to on. Uh, and just all those things combined uh, were like, uh, just like awakening sort of for me where I was like, oh yeah, why am I wasting time trying to make all this work? Like, I don't, I don't know why I'm bothering like when I could just go do this and it's so much easier to reason about. Yeah, so I think that um, every 20 years or so, there's a, there's a swing in a pendulum or a, par a new paradigm that emerges and, and you can almost set your watch by it and it's, it is about 20 years, and um, I think that one of the things that were interesting 
that, that we're um, interested in is that object-oriented programs have really a single dimension of extension, right? And um, when you step into Elixir or something like it, you have so many ways of accomplishing the same thing, whether it's protocols or pattern matching, or all these different ways to get the dispatch right and almost effortlessly so. Um, so yeah, so the idea of you were just looking for a higher level paradigm that lets you organize cleaner and better. Yeah, I like, like that. Somebody else want to take a crack at that one? What was the stuff that went wrong that prompted you to look somewhere else? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about that. With Ruby, you have uh, some state problems like Chris mentioned. Like bugs just kind of creep in and it's hard to guard against them. Uh, and you have to think pretty differently about your code. Uh, also, you have concurrency issues with Ruby. It's kind of hard to get to threads. Um, Java is fine. Like it's a really powerful language. It's just not very expressive for me. 